Have you ever wondered why this movie is called Rogue One? Sure, the name of the team in the movie is named Rogue One, but why did the writers choose that name? Why Rogue One? Well, Rogue One is the Rogue One. At the time, there were seven Star Wars movies, all part of a saga, all titled Star Wars Episodes 1 through 7. But in 2016, we were getting a new kind of movie, a spin-off movie. After this movie came out, there were eight Star Wars movies, and this movie was the Rogue One. So, Rogue One a Star Wars story, all these years later, how did it turn out? It appears to be the most popular of the five Disney Star Wars movies for sure. In fact, its popularity arguably led to one of its main characters getting his own show on Disney+. Plus. So does this movie hold up as one of the best Star Wars movies? Did the experiment of the Star Wars spin-off movies pay off? Did Rogue One add anything to the Star Wars mythos? Or was it a simple cash grab? My name is The Goldman, and let's take a look at Rogue One Star Wars story all these years later. One paragraph. All it took was one paragraph to inspire the creation of this movie. In 2003, the visual effects supervisor of the Star Wars prequel trilogy, John Knoll, suggested the idea of a story about the rebel spies who stole the plans to the Death Star. These concepts were used in a show George Lucas called Star Wars Underworld, even with a pilot being filmed. But the show was deemed too expensive and wasn't made. Around 10 years later, when Disney bought the franchise, Knoll felt that he owed it to himself to pitch the idea again, but this time to the Disney executives. Lucasfilm was interested in creating spin-off movies with their sequel trilogy, and when Kathleen Kennedy heard the idea, she loved it. In May of 2014, Gareth Edwards was brought on as director of this spin-off movie, and Gary Whitta would write the script. What the two of them wanted was to tell a war story. Star Wars does have the word wars in it, so tell a war story. Initially, the production of this film went smoothly. The script was finished, actors were hired, and filming began on August 8, 2015. Gareth Edwards prior to Rogue One was best known for his Godzilla film. While the film was nothing special, if there was one thing that Gareth Edwards understood, it was scale. Godzilla is a giant monster, and Edwards wonderfully conveyed that in his movie. Edwards masterfully captured this scope and scale into Rogue One. Star Wars has always been known for its incredible visual effects, but I wouldn't go as far to say that the original six Star Wars films had great cinematography. Sure, there were some brilliant shots, but they didn't dominate the film. Rogue One may be the most visually beautiful Star Wars film. It's in a close tie with The Last Jedi. Regardless of how the story panned out, the visuals would at least be incredible. Another aspect of the production of the film that was interesting was the introduction of deepfake technology in movies. Edwards wanted to include Grand Moff Tarkin into the story, but since the two films were concurrent with each other, he didn't want to recast the character. He wanted Peter Cushing to play Grand Moff Tarkin in 2016, even though he died in 1994. George Lucas always loved to push the boundaries of what was possible to put on the big screen. And of the five Disney Star Wars movies, Rogue One is the only one to honor Lucas and his revolutionary mind. And while the end result was okay, the production sparked a change in the film industry. In 2019's Captain Marvel, we got a fully de-aged Samuel L. Jackson for an entire movie. And in 2020, we were able to see the face of Luke Skywalker again in live action. So the credit of this new technology has got to be given to Gareth Edwards and his team. But anyway, filming went well, and in early 2016, a first screening was shown to the Disney execs. And, well, they didn't like it. It is well known that blockbuster movies go through reshoots, but the extent of the reshoots that Rogue One had to go through was far more extensive than any regular blockbuster, but still not as bad as what Solo went through. Lucasfilm brought on writer and director Tony Gilroy to oversee the reshoots. According to reports, the entirety of the final act of the movie was reshot, and this is evident if you look at the early trailers. If you look at some of the early teasers, almost none of these shots even made it into the final movie. But there are some shots that straight up contradict what happens in the final product. Like most famously, there's a shot of Jin and Cassian running across the beaches of Scarif with the Death Star plans in their hands. This not only doesn't happen in the movie, but even as a deleted scene, there is no way this could have ever happened. The details of what the original ending of this movie was have never been revealed to the public. But either way, that ending was significantly different from the final product. Speaking of the final product, Product, how did the story turn out? Did all these reshoots help the movie, or did it hurt it? I'm gonna break up this analysis into three parts, one for each act of the story, because each act has its own strengths and weaknesses. So let's begin with Act 1. The
The first act of Rogue One stems from the beginning of the movie to immediately after Tarkin says he will take control of the Death Star project. In this first act, Rogue One introduces a plethora of characters. Now this isn't inherently bad, but the way Rogue One does it leads to some jarring pacing. And this pacing that is often criticized is probably the largest criticism of the movie. In the first act, we jump from La Mu to Wobani to the Rings of Kathrine to Yavin 4 and to Jeddah. So in this first act, we jump to five different planets, six if you want to include the Death Star, and most of the time, the first act of a Star Wars movie will only take place in maybe one or two planets. Now, simply going to several planets in itself isn't a problem, but what's going on on these different planets is a problem, and here's why. The opening of the movie begins without the usual Star Wars text. Some people like this, and some people don't. I don't have a strong preference, but since the text isn't there, the viewer now knows less about the story than a usual Star Wars movie. Again, this isn't inherently good or bad. It's just an obligation this story now has to fill in more of the background because the opening text isn't doing this. I will say this though, the opening here with Jin when she was younger is an effective opening. It establishes Jin's backstory and what her inevitable relationship to her father, Saw, and the Empire will be. But once we flash forward in time after the iMovie looking title sequence, we are given three different viewpoint characters, Jin, Cassian, and Bodhi. We begin with seeing Jin as a prisoner, and then we jump across the galaxy to Cassian and Dor on some rebel spy mission. Then we jump to Bodhi getting captured on Jeddah. Why is this a problem? By introducing three stories at once that initially have relatively nothing to do with each other, you're asking the audience to keep track of a lot more information. If you look at the first movie in each Star Wars trilogy, and even Solo, they all begin by following one narrative. A New Hope follows the droids, and then when they meet Luke, the story follows him. In The Phantom Menace, the story follows Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon throughout the entire movie. And in The Force Awakens, the movie follows Poe and BB-8, which then leads us to following Finn. Now, the Force Awakens does have initial random jump to follow Rey, but since her storyline is simple to start and she crosses paths with BB-8 relatively quickly, a character we've already met, it isn't jarring at all. So the first movies in each of these trilogies are easy to follow because there's one ongoing storyline that eventually branches out. With Rogue One, we are introduced to three different branches of stories that eventually come together. This is harder for an audience member to follow. And since the cuts to each different location and character happen fairly quickly, we don't spend much time with these characters to begin with, and thus the pacing is jarring. What should have happened is that we begin the entire story from Jin's perspective, since she's the main character. We see Jin get captured, and once she's brought to Yavin 4, we meet Cassian Andor, and then once they've traveled to Jeddah, they meet Bodhi. But Goldman, if we do this, then we cut out the openings of Cassian's and Bodhi's stories, and thus we are missing crucial parts of the story. I fundamentally disagree with this. What do we lose if we cut out the two scenes that introduce Cassian and Bodhi? Cassian's introduction serves two narrative purposes, to show how the rebels know that there is an Imperial pilot who defected and has has vital information, and to show Cassian's willingness to do questionable things for the betterment of the Rebellion. I would argue the first thing I brought up is not important at all. If we cut out the scene entirely and the audience finds out there is an Imperial defector when Jin finds out, the audience is gaining the exact same information just in a different way. Do we need to have the viewpoint of Cassian when we find out this information? No. Also, if we find out this information along with Jin, then we the audience further put ourselves in Jin's shoes since this information is new to both us and Jin. In, and that's always a good thing. Now, the other reason why this scene exists is to show us Cassian's willingness to sacrifice for the Rebellion. This is a great moment and is crucial to Cassian's character arc, but we can easily have this moment shuffled to a later part in the story. Say when Jin and Cassian get to Jeddah. Cassian asks someone about some information and then kills that person afterwards. We get the exact same character moment, but this time we can see it from Jin's point of view, which again is always a good thing. So that's why Cassian's introduction should be removed. Now, what about Bodhi's introduction? I would argue that this movie would be better off if all scenes with Bodhi before we meet him in the jail cell were cut. And here's why. What do these scenes of Bodhi being captured and interrogated by the rebels accomplish? We learned that Saw is batshit crazy, and we learned that Bodhi's defection is genuine. If these moments were removed and we were just told there is a defector and that Jin and Cassian need to find him, the story would be better off because it would add some mystery. As we follow Jin and Cassian along their way to Jeddah, the audience is asking themselves who is is this pilot that defected, and is this information even true? As far as the audience is concerned, maybe this is just a trap by the Empire, or maybe this defector is really a spy. And when we are told by the rebel spies that Saw is some crazy radical, we ask ourselves if he is really crazy, or are the rebels just saying that? So sometimes a lack of a definitive answer is better. So simply removing the introductions of Cassian and Bodhi's stories, and having Cassian's murderous moment later in the story, fixes the troubling pacing of the first act. Now once we 
get to Jeddah, the pacing improves because again, we're following one linear story. Well, that and Krennic's story, but Krennic's story doesn't take up too much screen time. Fixing the pacing is great, but that doesn't solve the multitude of problems that this movie has. One major problem with this first act, and this is my biggest problem with the movie, is that Jin is not a well-developed character. It absolutely shocks me that so many people love this character. And I'm not mad about that. If you love the character of Jin Erso, more power to you. But here's my argument for Jin not being a well-developed character. So we get an introduction again, which is great, but then we jump in time around 15 years to her being in a jail cell. She gets rescued by some rebels, we see her show some signs of distrust, which is nice, and then she's taken to the rebel council where her crimes are listed off to the audience. Possession of unsanctioned weapons, forgery of imperial documents, aggravated assault, escape from custody, resisting arrest. We don't see Jin do any of this. We don't see Jin do anything that represents who she is. We just saw her as a kid, and then we saw her in prison. Then we are told she's a criminal. Imagine if you were watching Batman Begins. Bruce and his parents walk out of the theater, and his parents are killed. It's a sad moment. Then the movie jumps forward in time 20 years or so, and Bruce is already Batman. You're missing a major part of the story. It's integral to see how the death of Bruce's parents affected him and how he became Batman. Imagine you're watching Spider-Man, and we see him get bit by a spider. Then the movie jumps a year or so, and he's already Spider-Man flying around in New York. You're missing a huge part of the story because the events that followed Peter getting bit and how he became Spider-Man are just as important as what happens to him as he's Spider-Man. With Jin, this is all glossed over. We don't see what made her the woman she is or what kind of woman she is. I get this movie isn't a Jin Erso origin story. I don't expect this movie to give us a 30 minute montage of Jin's childhood and how she became this criminal. But say the movie devoted, I don't know, 10 minutes to showing us that Jin's a criminal. Say instead of beginning the story with her in jail, we see the event that got her thrown in jail. We saw her commit forgery of Imperial documents and we saw her resisting arrest. This one scene may not add anything to the plot of the rebels stealing the Death Star, but it adds tremendous value to Jin as a character because we learn so much more about her. So that's my problem with where the story picks up with her after all these years later. Now once the mission to Jeddah actually begins, we have another problem with Jin, and it's that Jin is a passive character. There are two types of protagonists in a story, an active protagonist and a passive protagonist. An active protagonist is a character that makes decisions that push the story forward. In Breaking Bad, once Walter gets lung cancer, he makes the decision to start cooking meth. He wasn't forced to do that. Moving back into the Star Wars universe, after Owen and Beru die, Luke makes decisions throughout the story. He makes the decision to join Obi-Wan and leave Tatooine. He makes the decision to try and save Leia. He makes the decision to turn off his targeting computer and trust in the Force. These are choices that he made that he didn't have to make. With Qui-Gon in The Phantom Menace, and yes, Qui-Gon is the protagonist of that movie, he makes decisions that push the story forward. He makes the decision to fly to Naboo. He makes the decision to take a gamble on Anakin in the pod race. He makes the decision to take Anakin to Coruscant, and he makes the decision to go back to Naboo. These are all decisions that he made that revealed his character. These characters that I listed are active characters. With Jin Erso, what choices does she make in the first act of this movie? She was told to hide, that wasn't her choice. She was captured by the rebels, that wasn't her choice. She was basically told to go to Jeddah, considering her alternative was to go back to prison, so she wasn't really given a choice there. When she's on Jeddah, she gets captured by Saw's partisans, that wasn't her choice. And when she's with Saw, the planet is in the process of exploding and she leaves. That wasn't her choice either. So in this first act, Jin doesn't make any choices. She makes minor choices like choosing to kick this one guy and choosing to steal a blaster and choosing to save a kid from danger. These are all moments that reveal to us what kind of person she is. But when it comes to important character defining decisions, she doesn't make any in this first act. And that's my problem with the introduction with her character. So moving on from Jin, another thing that I want to discuss, and this is kinda a hot take, is that Chirrut Imwe and Baze Malbus don't add anything to the story. I get that Chirrut is funny and his trust in the forest is kinda a part of the theme of the movie, but if we were to take Chirrut and Baze out of this movie, what changes? Jin and Cassian still go to Jeddah, they still get captured by Saul's partisans, they still leave Jeddah and go to Idu, they still leave Idu and go back to Yavin 4, and then they still go to Scarif and start a battle. Sure, you can say if it weren't for Chirrut, then Jin would have never suspected Cassian of attempting to kill her father, or if it weren't for Chirrut, then the master switch would have never been flipped, but these are moments that could easily be reworked. Have Jin suspect Cassian of killing her father because she simply doesn't trust him, and during the Battle of Scarif, have literally anyone else sacrificed their life to pull the master switch. So this is more so a problem with the entire movie rather than the first act? Fair enough. So if you were to take these two characters out of the movie, then more time could be spent with our main characters or even Bodhi. But anyway, I've been harsh on this first act, that's fairly clear. 
but this first act does have some great moments. As I stated earlier, Cassian killing this informant is a fantastic moment. This was an active decision that Cassian made, and we learned a lot about his values. This first act also does a decent job setting up the themes of the story. People often say Rogue One is a story of sacrifice, and while that's kind of true, that's only part of it. Rogue One is really a story about the importance of doing what's right, and how dangerous it can be when you don't. Jin begins the story as someone who is apathetic. She doesn't care about the rebels or the Empire. She's willing to do whatever it takes to survive. One of the best quotes in the movie is when Saw asks her, does it not bother you to see the Imperial flag rain across the galaxy? And she says, it's not a problem if you don't look up. This is a perfect quote that tells us exactly who Jin is and what she believes. Her story is ultimately about learning to forego her apathetic nature and fight for a cause that's right. And by the end of the story, she accomplishes that. With Cassian, he begins the story as a man who is willing to do awful things for the betterment of the rebellion. He seems to care more about the organization of the rebellion rather than what it stands for. He kills a dude simply because it's more convenient for him. That's not good. He's willing to blindly follow the rebellion's orders, and he's almost willing to kill Jin's father just because it's more convenient for the rebellion to kill an innocent man. And to start the third act, Cassian decides to ignore the rebellion's orders and lead a mission to Scarif. That is where his arc changes, but more on that later. And with Bodhi, he doesn't have an arc, but he chooses to do the right thing from the start. He defects from the Empire just to give the rebellion a chance. And the same thing could be said about Galen Erso. He spent 15 years as a prisoner to the Empire just so he could put a flaw in the Death Star so it one day may be blown up. If it weren't for each of these four characters, then the rebellion would have never won the war. If Bodhi never defected the Empire and told the rebels that there was a Death Star, then the Death Star would have never been blown up. If Jin never overcame her apathetic nature and told the rebels that they need to go get the plans on Scarif, then the Death Star would have never been blown up. If Cassian never stopped taking orders from the rebellion and never led the attack on Scarif, then the Death Star would have never been blown up. And if Galen Erso never spent 15 years of his life as a slave to the Empire, then the Death Star would have never been blown up. Doing what's right is what Star Wars is all about. So I gotta applaud the storytellers for at least staying true to the values of George Lucas. I know I went on a bit of a diatribe here about the themes of this movie, but if it weren't for the way this first act sets up these themes, then the ending wouldn't have paid it all off. And the final thing I want to talk about is the scene where Jin hears the message from her father. This scene was beautiful. Jin essentially lost her father. Yeah, he didn't die, but for all she knew, he might as well have been dead. And then she knew he went to work for the Empire. So for 15 years, she probably hated her father. In this scene here, she's essentially hearing a message from someone she thought she lost. I'm in a rather fortunate situation with my life. I've yet to lose anyone that is incredibly important to me. But if I were to, and then one day, 15 years later, I got a message from them, I would break down in tears. This is what Jin is going through, and the acting here from Felicity Jones is absolutely phenomenal. There's not much to say about this scene, but it's so perfect that I had to mention it here. And the other thing I kind of like about this movie is how they retconned why the exhaust port blows up the entire Death Star. Before, it was kind of stupid and convenient for the rebels that just one shot could blow up the entire Death Star, but I like how they added more complexity to that. And that's the first act. There's some moments of greatness, but overall, the first act struggles immensely from poor character development and poor pacing. The second act of Rogue One goes from the trip to Idu to the meeting with the Rebel Council. Now, a lot of people say that the movie starts to get much better once the characters go to Idu, but I disagree. I'm gonna pose you all a question. If this entire sequence of Idu was simply removed from the story, and after our characters leave Jeddah, they just go straight back to Yavin 4, what changes? When the Rogue One team leaves Jeddah, they already know they need to go to Scarif to get the Death Star plans. Jin is already committed to helping the Rebellion and uphold her father's request. Nothing happens character-wise that changes Bodhi, Chirrut, and Bayes in this act. Actually, nothing affects them really for the rest of the movie. Yes, we see Galen Erso die, but his death doesn't really change anything. Again, Jin is willing to help the Rebellion before she went to Idu, so plot-wise, absolutely nothing changes. The only part of the sequence that has a lasting impact on the story is Cassian's decision not to kill Galen. If an entire act of the story exists for only one minor reason, then the act is not worth it, and the 
thus it is a waste of time. I do want to focus on Cassian though because not only is his story affected by the second act, but he's also the only one who has a clear character arc. Some of you will say so does Jin, but more on that later. Cassian begins the story as someone who is willing to do morally questionable things for the betterment of the rebellion. There's a subtle theme that this story ties into, that sometimes you ultimately become the very thing you want to destroy. Now I'm not saying what the rebellion is doing here is as bad as the empire, but killing an innocent man in cold blood because he may pose a risk to the rebellion is not the right thing to do. So as we saw in the first act, he doesn't care if his actions are morally right. When he leaves Jeddah with Jin, he overhears a conversation between Jin and Bodhi about Galen. Remember, at this point in the story, Cassian has been tasked with killing Galen, but the rest of the crew, especially Jin, doesn't know. When Bodhi says that Galen was the one who convinced him to defect, and that he was told it's not too late to do what's right with his life, Cassian has a noticeable look of discomfort, because this is the man he's about to attempt to kill. So we get to Edu, Cassian finds a position on the cliffs to kill Galen, and then he ultimately decides not to kill him. Cassian has a noticeable character arc that doesn't change on a dime, it gradually changes. So by the time in the beginning of the third act, where Cassian says he's willing to go against the council's orders and help Jin on a mission to Scarif, it feels earned. Why do I put such an emphasis on this gradual change? Because character arcs are not supposed to happen instantly, it should happen over the course of a story. You ever wonder why the Martha moment in Batman v Superman didn't work for a lot of people? It's because Batman spent the entire movie trying to take down Superman, but after he hears the name Martha, then he decides to change his entire position on a dime. This is not a character arc, this is a character jump. And the same thing could be said about Jin. Remember, Jin has an apathetic worldview. She doesn't care about anything. But after she sees the message from her father, she instantly changes her entire worldview and now wants to fight for the rebellion. This is not a character arc, it is a character jump. Now some of you may argue that simply hearing a message can easily change someone's worldview. While this may be true, that doesn't mean it makes for good storytelling. What's the point of telling a meaningful story or conveying a powerful message if the character that represents that message can change who they are on a dime? There's a really easy fix to this problem, and it only involves two incredibly minor changes. Instead of Jin hearing that the location of the Death Star plans are on Scarif through the message on Jeddah, she hears it from her father in person right before he dies. This changes a lot more than you may realize. One, it gives the second act a narrative reason to exist. Instead of going to Edu to simply kill Galen Urso, they go there because they need to get more information from him. Two, this adds more consequences to Cassian's arc. Say the crew didn't know the location of the Death Star plans. If Cassian kills Galen, then the Rebel Alliance never receives that information. But since he would spare Galen and then Galen would tell Jin the information, there's a positive outcome that stems from Cassian's new worldview. And three, it allows Jin to actually go on a character arc. As it currently stands, Jin's final moments with her dad don't really change anything. Again, she was already committed to helping the Rebellion before he died. But let's say hypothetically after Jeddah, Jin wasn't fully committed to fighting for the Rebellion. All she cared about was finding her father. She still decides to make an active decision to leave the ship and go rescue her father, but because she now finds out this information because she risked her life to go see him, again like Cassian, there's a positive outcome that results from Jin's arc. If Jin was still apathetic, then she wouldn't go talk to her father and thus not hear about the location of the Death Star plans. So that's a simple change that I think could benefit the story greatly. Now one other thing that bothers me about Jin's arc is that even after her father dies from the Rebel Alliance, she is still 100% committed to helping them. Remember, Jin knows very well that it was Alliance bombs that killed her father. It would have been far more interesting narratively if Jin was conflicted at first about helping the Rebellion. Say she shows clear hatred towards the Rebellion for killing her father. When she returns to the Evan 4, she has to struggle to make a choice. Does she do what's selfish and easy and tell the organization that killed her father to screw off? Or does she set aside her personal grievances and do the right thing and help the organization that just killed her father? She would inevitably choose to help the Rebellion and then they would still end up successfully getting the plans. So again, this minor change in the story of showing Jin pissed at the Rebels adds to the message of the story. If Jin had never set aside her anger towards the Rebellion, then the Death Star would have never been destroyed. What I just talked about for the past two minutes or so is the exact reason why I get so frustrated with Jin's character. Because the story elements are there for a great character arc and a great story, but the minor decisions they made remove so much agency from Jin, and that's a problem. I have something similar to say about Bayes and Chirrut. These two are described as the Guardians of the Wills. They have been protecting this Jedi Temple for arguably their entire lives. In an instant, their home that they swore to defend was blown up, and they 
don't seem to really care. Bayes makes one comment confirming their entire home was blown up to Churret, but after that, it was never addressed again. And then for the rest of the movie, they don't do anything. It's like this story added interesting characters with interesting backstories with Bodhi, Churret, and Bayes, but after they are introduced, the only purpose they serve for the rest of the story is adding another point of view during the Battle of Scarif. As the story stands, it seems like the only reason Churret and Bayes agree to help with the mission on Scarif is simply because the Empire is bad and they must be stopped. What if the main reason that they wanted to help is because they hate the Empire for blowing up their home? This would give Churret and Bayes a personal stake in the Battle of Scarif. We destroyed our home. I fight the Empire now. Ugh, I get so frustrated because again, such minor changes like adding a few simple lines of dialogue gives our characters so much more agency. But the story doesn't do that, and thus the characters and the entire second act suffer. Now just like Act 1, Act 2 isn't the worst thing ever. There are still some great moments. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but for the first time in the movie we see Jin making active decisions, she decides to leave the ship and go find her father. This wasn't something she had to do, but she did it because seeing her father again even if it word for just a minute is important to her. There's also a part of this conversation on their way to Edu that I really like, and it's that Jin never grabbed the message. It seems like something so obvious to do, but she was so overwhelmed with hearing the message from her father that she forgot to grab it. It's a human mistake to make, and thus it makes me empathize with her more. In the conversation after they leave Edu, I quite like too. When Jin and Cassian are yelling at each other, it shows their different beliefs at this moment in the story. And I further believe that this conversation is a big reason why Cassian changes his mind decides to go against the rebellion to help Jin. So again, just like Act 1, Act 2 does have some good moments, but suffers immensely from missed opportunities and a lack of development for our main character. I have been harsh on this movie so far, and I stand by my criticisms, but none of that changes how brilliant this third act is. The Battle of Scarif is arguably a top three battle ever depicted in all of Star Wars. It has everything that a good battle needs. It has great character moments, and it sends a powerful message to the viewers. So let's analyze the Battle of Scarif. Oftentimes in stories, the best battles are the ones that are rather simple and have a clear goal. The Battle of Yavin. They need to shoot a hole into the Death Star and blow it up. The Battle of Helm's Deep. Simply survive long enough until Gandalf arrives. The Battle of Crate. Just survive until help arrives. The Battle of Endor. Deactivate the shield so we can fly inside and blow it up. When a battle gets too complicated, it's easy for the viewer to lose interest. Like in The Rise of Skywalker. Take out this nav tower so the Star Destroyers can't leave the planet because for some reason 1,000 Star Destroyers live and die by one nav tower and then wait for a bunch of people to arrive so they can shoot the guns off these Star Destroyers. See how that's a little complicated and confusing? With the the Battle of Scarif, it's simple. Find the plans to the Death Star and leave. So we have a clear goal. Now what else makes a great battle? Well, I'm gonna use the same example in this video as I did in my Lord of the Rings video, which you guys should definitely watch by the way. I'm gonna make an analogy here on what makes a great battle, but this analogy may be speaking to the wrong people. If you are a fan of any sporting event, what would you say classifies as a good game? Usually the best sports games ever are the ones that were close throughout where in the last minute or so it was anyone's game. If you are a fan of a specific team or player participating in a game, of course you want your team to win. Now, if your team blows out the competition, you'll be happy, but you wouldn't say it was a good game. Now, if your team gets blown out, not only will you be furious, but you'll still acknowledge that it was a bad game. If the game is close throughout, that means there are going to be moments where your team has some minor victories, like scoring some points, and there will be moments where your team suffers some minor defeats, like where the other team scores some points. If you were to look up all the best sports matches in history, they're all games that were either close throughout or there was a blowout but the losing team managed to come back and win. The same thing applies to a great battle. If you were to map the tension of a battle, the great ones will always look like that of a heartbeat, where the levels keep on going up and down, except as the battle progresses, the tension will get higher until a point where the good guys either win or lose. So any great battle must have two important components, contrast and escalation. A contrast between moments of victory and defeat and an escalation in rising tension. 
damage. Okay, so let's apply that to the Battle of Scarif. The battle begins rather slowly. Jin and Cassian are trying to go undercover while the rest of the rebels quietly place bombs over the entire base. We blow up the bombs and we get a mini victory. Then as the battle ensues, the Empire uses their best weapons to kill the rebels. A minor defeat. The rebel fleet shows up to help. This is a nice victory. But then we are informed that the rebel fleet showing up actually causes a major problem for the rebels. Because since the shield gate is closed, the rebels on the base can't leave. Thus, they now have to transmit the plans instead of simply leaving with the plans. I consider this a defeat because now there are extra steps our heroes need to take to win the battle. And also, there's a subtle realization from our heroes that they will probably die. Now, with this, we are given new obstacles. Oftentimes, the best battles also have many battles within them. The rebels need to get a signal off to the fleet. In order to do this, they must flip a master switch. So not only do we have a mini battle within a battle, we have a mini battle within that mini battle. And these battles ultimately come with victories and defeats. We get victories because the characters accomplish their goals, but also defeats because they die in the process. The same thing applies to K2. He accomplishes his goal in helping Jin and Cassian find the plans, but then dies in the process. When the rebel fleet finds out that they need to take down the shield gate, this is another mini battle that they must succeed at. Since all these mini battles that I mentioned are simple, it adds layers to the battle. Another reason why having all these mini conflicts within a battle works is because the harder it is to accomplish something, the more satisfying it is when the goal is accomplished. During the Battle of Starkiller Base, was it hard to blow up the planet? No, because all the resistance needed to do was make one explosion and that was it. In the Battle of Theed, was it satisfying when Anakin blew up the command ship? No, because he did it accidentally and without ease. With the Battle of Scarif, Rebels had to accomplish so many things in order to transmit the plans. All our heroes had to die and accomplish certain goals just so Jin can flip a lever. And this ties into another aspect of the battle that is so great. The story gives every character of the Rogue One team something to do during this fight. No one is just standing around doing nothing. They play an active part in winning this battle. This next point is a bit subjective, but it's also important that your battle has some cool shit in it. Seeing the Rebel fleet arrive is simply cool. The way the Hammerhead Corvettes crashed the Star Destroyers together was cool. Watching Baze kill all these Death Troopers was cool. Darth Vader showing up was beyond cool. Having these moments is more so just icing on the cake, but oftentimes it's the icing that makes someone appreciate the cake more than they probably should. So I hope all these aspects of the Battle of Scarif that I just pointed out help you understand what makes a great battle. All these mini battles are filled with conflict and escalation, victories and defeats, victories and defeats, and this contrast in emotions is what makes a great battle. The next part of this third act that I want to talk about is how the story wraps up. The way Rogue One wraps up the stories of our main characters and what messages it sends is so beautiful. When the Rebels first land on Scarif, Jin gives this great speech. We'll take the next chance and the next on and on until we win or the chances are spent. I love Jin's attitude here. The Rebels know that the odds are incredibly against them. And what Jin reminds them is so human. Just take it one step at a time and maybe we'll end up accomplishing something. And they do all end up dying, but there's a reason why it's not tragic. In reality, all humans live their entire lives for how they feel right before they die. When you're on your deathbed, do you feel proud with what you did during your life or do you feel regret? Now, what constitutes pride is different for every person. But what Star Wars argues is that the most important thing you can do in your life is to do the right things. All the characters of the Rogue One team begin the story in a rather dark place. Baze and Chirrut are wasting their lives away guarding a fallen temple. Bodhi was wasting his life being a pilot for an organization he knew was evil. Cassian was doing evil things that he knew were wrong. And Jin had no purpose in her life. I have a feeling that when each of these five characters died, they had a feeling of satisfaction in them. Chirrut dies believing he will become one with the Force. Baze dies knowing he will be with his best friend again. Bodhi dies knowing he helped the rebellion and did what's right. Let's compare this to Krennic's story. Krennic in the beginning of the movie says he wants to build the Death Star so he can bring peace and order to the galaxy. But we know later on that isn't true. He doesn't care if the Death Star may or may not bring peace. All he cares about is getting credit for the Death Star so he can move up in rank. So when Krennic is laying down and he looks up at the Death Star, do you think he died satisfied with his life? No way! He died by the very thing he devoted his life to creating. So the villains probably died with regret and the heroes died with satisfaction. With Jin and Cassian, I love their ending so much. When they successfully send the plans to the rebels, both of them know they are probably gonna die. But there's an immense satisfaction they both share. Cassian tells Jin that her father would have been proud. And I think after hearing this, Jin dies content with her actions. Had she stayed apathetic to the world, she probably would have died miserable. But here she can die knowing that all her father's efforts weren't for nothing. That she at least gave the rebellion a chance. But this ending also sends another powerful
powerful message that sometimes you won't be rewarded for doing the right thing, but that doesn't mean it wasn't worth it. You know why so many people love the endings of The Dark Knight and Spider-Man No Way Home? Because what they did was so incredibly noble. They basically sacrificed everything and no, they will never get acknowledged for it. Batman sacrifices his reputation just so Gotham won't collapse, and Spider-Man sacrifices every living relationship he has to the world to be safe, and neither gets praised for that at the end. But the praise wasn't why they did it. They did it because it was right. With Jin and Cassian, sure they will eventually be acknowledged for their efforts and their sacrifices, but what they did that was so noble was not knowing if their sacrifices were ever going to pay off. They didn't sacrifice their lives to destroy the Death Star, they sacrificed their lives so there's a chance of the Death Star being destroyed. Jin and Cassian won't ever know if their sacrifice was worth it. They won't even be there to celebrate with the Rebels at the end of A New Hope. They are willing to die so others can maybe celebrate. Sacrificing your life for something that isn't guaranteed is so incredibly noble that we can't help but admire these characters. And the themes of sacrifice for what's right, regardless of the outcome, is so crucial to the values of Star Wars that honestly, this ending alone justified the existence of the entire movie. Because at the end of the day, the point of Star Wars movies is to tell stories that send powerful messages. And even though Rogue One has immense problems with it, the message it sends is so beautiful. And this alone is the most important reason as to why the Battle of Scarif is so great. Now, of course, as great as everything is, I can't talk about the battle without talking about Darth Vader. Yeah, his hallway scene was badass, but we can't ignore how tense this scene is. We spend a whole movie with these characters we just met, only for them to be killed off and at least in the rest of the movies never mentioned again. These characters sacrificed their own lives just so a disc can get into the hands of a princess. When the rebels are passing the disc off to each other and the door gets stuck, it makes you realize how close of a call this all was. Had there not been a rebel on the other side of the door, then all the lives lost on Scarif would have been for nothing. All these men in this hallway sacrificed their lives to put the rebels in this position to win. A bit of a tangent, but I believe that the Star Wars movies should be watched for the first time in chronological order, not release order. And a big reason why is because of the added stakes that are added to the final battle of A New Hope. When you watch Rogue One and the sacrifices so many people made, it adds more emotional weight to Luke destroying the Death Star. All these people died so Luke could be in this moment. Everything that happened in Rogue One and A New Hope builds up to this moment and it pays off wonderfully. I love the theme of sacrifice that Rogue One conveys, and while Vader's massacre is brutal, it also in a way shows the bravery of so many men. But this is Vader's massacre, and it actually does add to the character of Darth Vader. Up until this point, we've only ever heard how powerful Darth Vader slash Anakin was. Granted, he was powerful in the prequels, but the Vader we see in the originals shows his power in a different way. We see his intimidating nature and how he has no qualms about disposing of the lives of people who have failed him. But at least in live action, we never saw the physical side of Vader. When I think of Vader in a battle, I like to think of a tank. Something that's slow, but man is it powerful. This is one aspect of the ending of Fallen Order that I absolutely love. Since the game makes it literally impossible for you to kill him, he feels like an invincible tank that's chasing you. Kind of like the Slender Man, but far more brutal than scary. The ending of Rogue One absolutely portrays Vader as a tank. The single moment though that really hits home is the reactions of the Rebels. One of my favorite sayings when it comes to storytelling goes something along the lines of, it's not the action that's powerful, but the reaction that's powerful. When a beloved character dies, it's usually the reaction of those around the dead character that makes the viewer more emotional, not necessarily the action alone. Seeing the facial expressions of the rebels lets us know that they are shitting their pants in real time, and just the screams of one of the rebels yelling help us was wonderfully acted. The horror in his voice, similarly to the way the one guy yells launch at the end. The scene works so well as a horror scene, if you will, because of these reactions from the rebels. But my only complaint is that I wish we hadn't seen him in this movie up until this point. His conversation with Krennic is kind of pointless. Even for people who hadn't seen any Star Wars movie before Rogue One, if there is one man you do not need to explain to the audience who they are, it is Darth Vader. If this was the moment we first saw Vader, and Vader wasn't in the marketing of the movie, the absolute chills that would be sent down everyone's back would be unforgettable. But either way, this scene is still badass, and it is a perfect conclusion to one of the best battles ever put to Star Wars.
What is the legacy of Rogue One? Is it that it's the best Star Wars movie to come out of Disney? Well, to some it may be, certainly not me. But for me, the legacy of Rogue One is the willingness to take a risk. Ever since The Last Jedi came out, Star Wars has been afraid to take risks. Every single story that has come out after Rogue One that isn't a sequel trilogy film is named after a single character. Solo, Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, Ahsoka, The Acolyte, Lando. I'm sure some of these shows will be great and some of them will be bad, but I kinda miss the idea of a story stemming from a concept and not a character. Rogue One took a risk and tried to tell a story about characters no one knew. Instead of Lucasfilm thinking, what character can we make a show about, I wish they would think, what would be a really cool story to tell in the Star Wars universe? And the idea of telling the story about people who stole the plans to the Death Star is a great idea. Regardless of how the film panned out, I will always appreciate the concept of this movie and how great it was. Maybe Lucasfilm needs more John Knowles, more people to walk into an office and pitch the concept of a movie on a piece of paper. And you never know, maybe one day we'll get another rogue Star Wars movie. Another movie that deviates from the Skywalker saga and tells a new and unique story with new and unique characters. Maybe one day we'll get another Rogue One.